one. This is Jared Clough and Kevin Marchand. And this is the second episode of Critical Absorption. Now, for the first episode, our original name was Lit It Up. But to say in few words that name did not stick with us <laughs> that much through the month of November. <laughs> um, the new name, Critical Absorption, um, pretty much the definition of the name is that we as humans, I think, work as sponges and we are constantly taking in information from what we read, from the people we meet, from the things we do, and we're constantly taking in countless amount of information. And in order to create our own opinions, our own criticisms, and our own identities, we absorb what we can and we squeeze everything out of it and take whatever out of it that we possibly what we need, what we don't need, what we find is acceptable, what is just a waste of time. And in the end, you get that idea of pretty much the sponge that you are. You keep what you want, you get rid of what you don't. So this is critical absorption. We read books, we take out details, we read quotes and break down the writing to the point where we just squeeze every ounce of humanity out of the pages. Or at least we try, so let's get into it. All right, so this second book that we're doing is called The Autograph Man by Zadie Smith. Uh, she's now a pretty famous writer at this point. Uh, her most famous book, I think, is called White Teeth, and she has a new book called Swing Time that I've seen on a lot of uh, bookshelves and in a lot of bookstores and probably displayed. So this book was written in 2002. I think it was our first one. Um, I tried reading another one by her called N.W., which I didn't find quite as captivating, but I'm going to give it another shot because I really enjoyed this one. And the way we're going to do this is I'm going to kind of try and bring us through the prologue and uh, the book one, and then Jared is going to bring us through book two and the epilogue to the end. So uh, there's a quote in the front of the book from Franz Kafka that I think is important to read because I think it sets up the, the story nicely, and it's a theme that we're going to see echoed throughout, and she actually... Uh, mentions Kafka a few times. Um, so he says, Naturally things cannot in reality fit together the way the evidence does in my letter. Life is more than a Chinese puzzle. So our main character's name is Alex Lee Tandem, and he is a Chinese, uh, of Chinese descent. He's Chinese, but he lives in Britain. He lives in London. Um, and the book starts off with a long, like, 35-page prologue of when he was just a kid. Um, and him and his friends are going to see a wrestling match with Alex Lee's dad, who he's pretty close with. Um, and his dad's a doctor. Um, and there's an important quote on the third page that I actually, I actually think this first little paragraph here I would like to read. Because I think it just, obviously, as most first pages do, I think it just sets up the story really nicely. So he says... Zohar, the wrestling match. He has the ability to imagine himself a minor incident in the lives of others. It is not an abstract thing. He would, he would not know quite what you meant by abstract. He is 12. He simply knows that if he imagines swimming in the sea, well, while most children will think immediately of the cinematic shark below them, Alex Lee Tandem is with the lifeguard. He can see himself at that, as that smudge on the horizon, his head mistaken for a bobbing buoy, his wild arms hidden by the roll of the surf. He can see the lifeguard, a bronzed and languid American, standing on the sand with his arms folded, deciding there's nothing out there. Alex sees the lifeguard wander off down the beach in search of those German girls from yesterday in a cold drink. The lifeguard buys a Coke from a passing vendor. The shark severs Alex's right calf from his body. The lifeguard settles up to Tanya, the pretty one. The shark drags Alex in a bloody semicircle through the water. The lifeguard speaks kindly to her ugly friend with the flat chest, hoping for brownie points. Some vertebrae snap. Did you see that? A seal, says Tanya, mistaking Alex's desperate hand for the turn of a glossy flipper. And then he's gone. Is it a bird? Is it a plane? Is it a seal? No, it's me drowning. This is how things go for Alex Lee. He deals in a short hand of experience, the TV version. He is one of this generation who watch themselves. And originally, I was just going to mention that last line. He is one of the generation who watched himself. But I just think that's really interesting, showing the way that Alex Lee has this very hyperactive imagination. And we're going to get into multiple things that he is maybe imagining about the way that his life is or the way that reality is. Um, 
but the TV version, uh, one of a generation who watched themselves, it's going to be something that I'm going to carry all through book one because this is a major, major this whole book is a major comment on our uh, TV generation. So it's interesting to follow that through. Um, so what we find out as we move through the prologue is that Alex Lee's dad has cancer in his brain or a brain tumor. I don't know exactly what it is. Uh, something, he's, he's dying. And he hasn't told Alex Lee or his mom yet. Um, and ironically, I guess you could say, uh, he dies at the end of this prologue. He dies as Alex and his friends are trying to fight their way through the crowd to meet one of the professional wrestlers that they're there to see. And I could have, I could have, I guess, gone through more in the prologue, but I think this is the important part to talk about because yes, he, he meets, uh, he meets Joseph there with his friends, Adam and Reuben Fine, who are going to be throughout the rest of the book, but we can talk about them more when we get there. I don't think it's that interesting to talk about them when they're kids, but this last paragraph, um, when his dad dies, helps to carry this uh, theme of the generation who watches themselves forward because they're here at this professional wrestling match, which everybody knows it's not like college wrestling. It's not like high school wrestling. Professional wrestling is this show. It's this conscripted or prescripted event that everyone goes to already knowing what's going to happen. They already know that the wrestler who they're all there to see is going to win. They're going to drag it out and they're going to, hurt each other but basically they're they're at this facade of experience and amid that alex lee's dad is suffering his head's getting worse he's trying to fight through the crowd and then he falls down and it says klein is the first to get to him then reuben fine by pushing and then joseph and alex lee jin can't see where adam is and then the root closes up like the red sea in front of him and lee jin can get no further he tells himself not to panic about adam and his concentrates instead on reaching up on tiptoe he is in time to see him right ruffle alex lee's hair punch him playfully on the shoulder and take his picture for signing as soon as the names across it alex whips around delighted and jumps up looking for Lee Jin so he can show it to him and Lee Jin jumps up too and tries to wave but he is too small to get above the crowd like this and Alex's creased forehead is the last thing Lee Jin sees before his knees crumble beneath him and his head hits up the floor once on his back though his eyes open for a few seconds he sees the hall squidge and then squadge sounds gloop the light shrinks he sees people many many people nobody famous though no one familiar or friendly no one to help no one he knows so one interesting thing to mark from that is in that first line klein is the first to get to him him is capitalized the way that we would capitalize god's name um and at first the first time I read it, I actually had to read it a couple times because you he falls down. I even just said it wrong introducing. I said he's already collapsed. He didn't collapse until halfway through. So I thought the him that we were talking about was Alex's dad, was Lee Jin, the first to get to him. Because I knew, like I already knew at this point that he was like going to die right then. It was pretty obvious. Um, but I thought that's what they meant. But him is the professional wrestler at the, at the front that they were trying yes. to get through to get the thing. And like they capitalized him. So, like, right from the beginning, this idea of fame, this idea of autographs, this idea of, be, like, being shown to be a part of this thing that everybody else is looking at is, like, seen as divine from the beginning. And Alex Lee's dad is a few paces behind, dying, and everybody's wrapped up in this facade of fame at the front, and he collapses with no one familiar or friendly, no one to help, no one who knows. And... The role of that this death plays throughout the rest of Alex's life is going to be a complicated one that we can talk about throughout the book, but this fact of like being alone and being being forgotten by the world because it's like just clinging on to these idols and this fame and Alex, as we will see, falls into that that trap despite maybe what uh, what we just got out of that do you have anything you want to say about the prologue before we move on to book one yeah just to carry on yeah um the m line capitalizing him um a big thing to note is this is alex's first autograph so yes he is not an autograph person up until this moment 
and you have him that is capitalized, almost signifying the pro wrestler to be on the same level as a god. Uh, and that's how he's being looked at by the crowd here. But you're right, this is going to have a huge impact on how Alex views not even just the, de- the death of his father, but more the hobby of being an autograph man. And um, I think we will see where there's a fatuation with Kitty Alexander all through this. Yes. That in many ways, Kitty takes form as similar to a god in a way to Alex Lee. Very much Which we'll so. definitely talk a more about um, going on. But yeah. That, that's a good point. That would probably be the other important thing to mention from the prologue is that going into this wrestling event here, Alex had not the slightest interest in autographs it was the uh joseph klein the boy that he met there with his dad um who collected autographs and his that kid's dad klein's dad thought he was a little weird and thought he was a fairy for like spending so much time in his room just with his autographs and stuff he wanted him to get out there and do things and uh but as as we'll see now moving into book one this idea of autographs has really captured alex and his overactive imagination as he gets Uh, further in life. So we'll start book one here, Mount Joy, which is where they live. The Kabbalah of Alex Lee Tandem. And there's another quote at the the front here that says, take me to the center of everything, which I think is just a good uh, thing to keep in the front of our mind here because this book also has a very... There's like a spiritual element to this book. Like Alex and all his friends are on the quest to find to the center of everything and they're... I would say very much, or at least Alex is, very much distracted by this facade of fame still. So, sure. let's move forward here. Find an important quote here. So, okay, I, I know the first thing that I probably wanted to talk about. So, we mentioned this briefly when we were just texting, talking about this book, but I think I actually like what you said. I asked you, so I texted Jared and I said, what did you think of the book? Because I, I recommended that we do this one. Because I had just read it a couple months ago. And you said the writing was fantastic, the plot was good, and the characters were great. And that's probably just like exactly the way to describe this. So there are some moments here where we really want to just look at the writing. And no matter how much of this book we get through, anyone listening to this should still pick up this book and read it. Because we're not going to touch any like degree of the depth that's in this book. Like There are just certain lines and certain paragraphs that you want to read multiple oh, times because yeah. it strikes you each time. So one thing that uh, Zadie Smith does throughout to demonstrate this TV generation, I think, I see a deep connection here, is she always talks about uh, international gestures. Did you pick up on this? Did this have anything, any impact on you? Oh, yeah. International yeah. gestures. So let me, let, me find, let me find a good uh, spot where this is in the first chapter. If you if you have a good example, that would be great, but I'm going to try and find one because there are a lot of them. But I'll keep talking while we look. And what I think this idea sort of signifies is even with even with Alex and his close friends, who we, we, we get to see all of them throughout this and him interacting with all of them, and even with these people he's known for 15 years that he's great friends with, they're these sort of prescribed ways of acting uh, without each other. And there's there's these things that Zadie Smith capitalizes as international gestures. In other words, um, ways of acting. Here's a good one. So this is a little further. It's in, on page 62, but I have a feeling I'm going to kind of be just jumping around here because it's tough to go with the plot of this because so much happens. So... Alex swore very gently at Reuben Fine. Reuben Fine gave Alex the international gesture for not swearing in front of rabbi-looking rabbis. And then it says in parentheses, crossed eyes and flared nostrils. And then Alex gave Reuben Fine the IG for not mentioning his book ever. And it's just like, you could you could just say that this is just uh, nonverbal communication between friends. But even at the, if we, just to jump back to the prologue for a minute, when Alex Lee's dad is standing there talking to Joseph's dad, there's an awesome saying that it's not international gesture, but it's the same exact idea of two men at a sporting, two strange men at a sporting event and how they should be talking. And he talks about how Joseph's dad like violated that norm and that expected way of communicating with each other by sort of like scoffing at an idea that Alex Lee's dad said or something. So I don't, I don't know how this hits you, but to me, it's just, it's another 
it's this like they're trying to get to the center of things. They're they're talking about how in the 21st century with the, with fame and with our busy lives because that's one thing. Everyone's going through these these busy lives and missing each other. Ruben finds a rabbi now. Adam has a uh, rental movie rental store. Alex is the least busy one because he's just the autograph collector. But it's just as you go about trying to get to the core of people's identity and understand who they are, you're separated by this wall of international gestures and just ways of interacting that you that you should. I don't know if you have anything to say about that. No. Oh, my computer's about to die, by the way. Is it? it, it it's not 50 uh, minutes. Anyway, I'll call you real soon. Okay. But um, at this point in the book, what I just patiently continue to do through chapters was really look at the conversations Alex is having with his friends and try to gather where they are at their lives, how their lives are different, kind of like what you're talking about. They they are very different people, mm-hmm. but they, they are in, they're connected by history and they're connected by the same faith. They are all Jewish, um, which is a huge, huge connection for them because even though Alex seems to be the least religious of them all, he still identifies as a Jew. Yes. And he... And he's he obsessed with it, through, too. Yeah, and he, he's, even he can communicate through it, like not so much speak Hebrew as fluently as his friends, but he can talk about rituals and he can talk in-depth, um, have in-depth conversations about spirituality and religion, and he can, he understands it. He understands what it is. He isn't quite sure where he fits in with Judaism, I feel, Mm -hmm. especially at the beginning of the book. He's not sure if it really is for him. Um, And that's sort of the... still kind of... What was that? You you can go. Um, I'm going to give you a phone call. Okay. All right. So, yeah, we're going to cut out for one minute. Jared, I'm just going to keep talking while I wait for you to call me. Um, Let me grab my phone. So, we knew this was going to happen, humble audience, and... uh, Jared's <laughs> Jared's computer is dying and he can't find his charger, so he's calling me. And there should be no break in the audio. Here we go. And I'm gonna put you on speaker over here. Alright, so give me a Oh, okay, so we're gonna have to turn Skype off now or it's gonna be painful. Okay, there we go. Okay. All right, that was... How, how much is, is my voice picking up well enough? It should be, yeah. You're right next to the speaker. It should be good. All right, cool. All right, so I was just going to I was just gonna piggyback off what you just said there. Um, he's actually obsessed with Judaism. He's actually obsessed with the idea of Jewishness, even though he doesn't consider himself to be religious. And that's exemplified by this very interesting... Oh book that Zadie Smith has him writing. He's writing a book, I forget exactly what he calls it, but basically he's making lists of things that he considers Jewish, actions, thoughts, ideas, habits, and things that he considers goyish. Why'd the call end? We'll see how much of that he got. All right, here we go. Call him back. Oh no! What happened? Dude, I don't know, man. For some reason, you. cut right off. <laughs> you were like talking, and out of nowhere, it's like silence. And I was like, "Oh shit!" Was it the end of a sentence? Yeah, like, okay. I'm like, what? So there shouldn't be All much right. of a there shouldn't be much of a <laughs> delay there. Um, it's, pro- it's probably from my side. I'm going upstairs because I was in my room, which is in the basement, so it's probably from me. Okay, that's fine. Um, so did you hear what I was saying? I was just saying that he's making, he's obsessed with finding out what ways of being he should consider Jewish and what ways he could sh- consi- should consider Goyish, which I wasn't familiar with that word, but I looked up with it, and I think it, it, from what I found, it just means not Jewish, which makes sense. So he's... He's uh, trying to analyze Jewish ways of being in the world and non-Jewish ways of being in the world. And I think it's because he's extremely torn in his identity and in what he, how he wants to be in the world. And I think he's trying to find where he fits and where, or what he should align with. And of course, well, we can talk about that more, but if you want to pick up on that. Joseph, like he almost doesn't 
try to get him and Alex to hang out. But he, he, off, he has this great line uh, where he says, like, he can't help but think, like, will Joseph just be another kid who Alex meets and just disappears? Or, or is, is this the kid that could change his life? Is this the kid that could, that he could, like, hang out with that would call him up? Um, You there? Are you still there? Oh, yeah. You there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. The, 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 there was just a little bit of a delay, so I didn't know if you were still talking. Yeah, no, yeah, I think uh, I think that's exactly it. Uh, yeah, I think that's exactly it. And so so let's, let's get into a little bit now about uh, just fill everyone in on a little bit of the plot, because I'm just kind of moving through here. I'm somewhere in Chapter 4. I'm looking for just the most important passages that I think we should read. But plot-wise, what's going on? Because the plot isn't the most important part at all. As you said in your statement, the plot is good. It's the characters more that we want to talk about and the themes. Yeah. So, especially book one. Especially book one. Exactly. Definitely. Right. The plot, the plot becomes more important when he goes to New York in book two. That's definitely true. Um, but in part one, basically, the when the book opens, when book one opens, Alex has basically woken up after three days of just non-consciousness after like basically a bad acid trip essentially and during that acid trip he is as you you mentioned kitty alexander a little while ago basically kitty alexander was this famous actress from the 50s who as an autograph man it's sort of his achilles heel maybe maybe that's not the exact right phrase but it's the in a profession where he should just be getting autographs, selling them, making money, he is obsessed with Kitty Al- with Kitty Alexander, and he writes her fan letters every week, trying to get like actual uh, an, an actual autograph from her. And she's sort of famous for not doing autographs. That's the other part of it. Um, and what he realizes after waking up on this acid bad acid trip is a lot of things happen during that trip. One is that he claims that he received an autograph from her in the mail. And he sort of walked in with everyone else who was on the trip and said that he had it. And his friends essentially think that he went into the kitchen and forged it because he's good at recognizing for, he basically, he knows what her real autograph looks like. So it's possible that he could have forged it. And so his friends are kind of on his case from the beginning saying he needs to get rid of it. He needs to, forget about this and like move past this obsession and so like she doesn't mail out autographs to people like it just doesn't happen you didn't get one from her and he's convinced that he did and during that night also his girlfriend esther of 10 of about 10 years who he's been dating who is also adam's brother ironically and even deeper back actually alex lee's dad actually changed the pacemaker in her chest when he was still alive, or put the pacemaker in her chest when she was still alive um and he crashed his car with her when he was on the bad acid trip. And she didn't get super hurt, but she, like, broke a finger. And, like, their relationship's essentially on the rocks. And the important thing to mention about this is, in, to some sense, this pursuit of fame and this pursuit of this autograph is more real to Alex than his relationship with Esther. It takes a long time. It takes literally until right near the end of book one for them to actually start communicating again and even then it's actually just through instant message they they talk on the phone real quick but esther basically hangs up when she says that she's get, having an operation to get her pacemaker changed on sunday will alex be there but he's going to an autograph convention in new york this is a little bit near the end but of the book of book one but it's still important to mention because there's this there's this thing about what's more real in Alex's mind. And we saw in that first passage we read his overactive imagination. It's like, does he care more about mending his relationship with Esther or, or whether this autograph from Kitty Alexander is real? Yeah. And, and there's, there's definitely one thing that's really important to mention. Um, when they got in that car accident, we, we hear this from Adam, who is Esther's brother. Yeah. And Alex's best friend. So there's definitely a lot. Of, everyone's close here. They're, like, it's not as if this is a unstable friend group. I mean, you could say it's unstable, but they are very close. They've been in each other's lives for a while. Um, so they know each other very deeply. And one big thing that happens in this car accident, um, Adam tells uh, Alex this, that when, after he crashed the car, 
<laughs> yes. Hoping the autograph didn't get ruined. And now, now if you really think of this through Esther's point of view, you knew that your boyfriend of 10 years is a huge autograph man, and he is extremely obsessed with Kitty Alexander. Kitty Alexander is by far his infatuation. And when you see this to the point where you actually physically physically have been hurt and you were the one physically next to them Kitty Alexander is not physically there but somehow her autograph becomes more important than your well-being as his girlfriend and you can see through Esther's eyes that they have not talked they don't talk to like maybe chapter 8 or so yeah but it, it, you, you really get a sense the way Zadie sets up this book is I mean it is there's tension <laughs> oh yeah I mean, Esther and um, and Alex are not talking, and clearly it's because this whole thing with that autograph and Alex's reaction during the car accident has really left them questioning how much they really care about each other and if Kitty Alexander is more important than Esther in the eyes of Alex. Definitely. Yeah, and, and I think it's in, what you mentioned in the beginning about this being a very close-knit group of people is definitely important to talk about because to get back to the plot again for a minute, um, one important reality in this story is that Alex's friends and Esther, to some extent, are trying to... I don't want to use the word like save or fix because obviously that has a very moralistic tinge to it and like who's to say that they're right but whatever leaving all that aside they're really trying to get him to i would say come back to reality a little bit more and get out of this world of fantastical infatuation a little bit um but this is complicated by the fact that alex's job as an autograph man had uh by necessity he has relationships with other people and two of those people are Ian Dove and Lovelier and did, the, did these two characters make an impact on you? Yeah so I mean those two characters are the people who are also currently autographed men who yes. are in the, the profession as well as Alex so in other words these are Alex's co-workers you could say. Right and what, did you see something significant about the sort of dichotomous essence of of their relationship to Alex as opposed to his friends like because even though this is the thing about international gestures and I, I, I am serious when I say that I think that separates them a little bit but there's no denying that these as you said these people that grew up together they're extremely close and they have a very deep rich relationship even with Ruben Fine who Alex sort of again and again says that he just doesn't basically indicates that he doesn't really like that much but Still, they grew up together as kids. They know each other sort of very, very deeply. And then with Lovelier and Ian, they sort of, they don't outright uh, condone and support Alex's delusion about Kitty Alexander, but they don't um, they don't sort of subtly attack it the way that Adams tries to get him to abandon it, and the way that Joseph tries to do that. They they because they're in the same business and stuff. They kind of support it, and they just kind of live in this fan- fantasy world too of pursuing autographs all the time and the first time that we see them they're at an auction and basically after the auction it's like two in the afternoon and they go to a bar and just get absolutely like blasted at like two in the morning off alcohol um and then a guy that they don't like another autograph man comes in and they just kind of make a scene and like some of it's funny but it's also excuse me there's something very sad about them and about Alex too when he's with them like he just becomes like a little more of a miserable or pitiful being and I just it, she sets that up he, he we're gonna see that he spends a lot of time with his friends and a good amount of time with Ian and Lovelier throughout the book especially in book two um and it's just it's the, the it's these tensions within Alex it's it's the reality fantasy tension it's the goyishness Jewish tension like this is these are bad forces on his life in my opinion and to some extent at least in book one they went out I mean he it's not that he 
spends more time with them, but he spends, I think, a sufficient amount of time with them to continue derailing his life. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, uh, I've only highlighted four lines out of this entire chapter where we meet Dove and Love Lear. Yeah. And it really, I think, I think it speaks to them very much. Um, so for, on page 89 for me, yeah, that's, uh, it's, it's, uh, he's talking about Ian Dove, and it says, <laughs> that's a good um, one. So this, this is that's a good example. I mean, Alex compared when his friends look at Alex, when Alex's friends take a look at him, they they see someone who's living in a fantasy world, almost similar to a musician or an artist, kind of, sort of, where you don't have a real job, but somehow you're you're somewhat able to make a living out of it, and it's not the most stable living, but it is a living, and. His friends have definitely settled settled down more than Alex ha- has. Um, I think Alex is just slightly much more unstable than his friends are, and, and his his life is clearly all over the place because that is the life of an autograph man. And you see that with their, what he does with his friends, going to the bar, just getting extremely drunk. It's it's a sad business. Yeah, it's a lot of. It's buying something and selling it, or it's also a lot of disappointment discovering that what you spent money on was a forgery and you just lost money. It's, it's gambling in a way. In many ways, it reminds me of like a casino environment where you're kind of just in it, spending money and hoping that you get profit out of it. Um, but like another line, Alex said on page 94, um, everything Alex had ever shown lovelier, lovelier had maintained to be a forgery just for the hell of it. Um, This is a good way to describe Love Lear. I mean, he's the type of guy who he respects Alex because Alex is in the autograph man business. Alex is known as one of the top dogs, like in terms of professional autograph men. But he's known, he has this mentality from the, the bums of the business. You know what I mean? Yeah. So everyone Alex hangs out with, these people he's drinking with, they are all like the bottom feeders. Right. And Alex is the king or the idol of all the bottom feeders. Like he just seems to have a symbol of success in the business or a knowledge of the business that others wish they had. Which psych- um, which psychologically explains exactly why he's drawn to them and sort of away from his friends to some extent. Cause they, his friends are telling them what it is. And Alex, you're like down in the dirt a little bit. You got to stand up and pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And then over there, it's like the one person who envies Alex Lee, his life. It's like, how do you, how do you just easily turn away from that? It's kind of a nice thing to be revered by people, even if it is the bottom feeders. Absolutely. And one thing that he does with, himself there are friends you have who are only good when drunk and he's talking about this with um with uh his friends that just kind of started teasing bogley and bogley is is another autograph man who's kind of more snippy and snotty than others and um and he's possibly even doing a little better than alex possibly yeah he's probably alex's prime competition if there's right. anyone who he can with is Bogley and and you really get the sense of there's like this it, it's just it's very dark it's definitely it's very you're in you're, you're at the bottom here in this business you're not hanging out with um, people who are just succeeding every day it's a very uh, dark and glim um, business and the person who's suffering the most is Brian Duchamp and I think Brian's a really big image because Brian is an older gentleman who Alex sees uh, when he often goes to auctions. But Brian is like the symbol of what the of like the unfortunate state that you could fall in if the autograph business gets the best of you. Definitely. Is that what you would say? I would I would definitely agree with that, yeah. He he basically he gets kicked out of all the auctions. He comes in and makes such a 
such a ruckus every time and he yells out that everything's fake because apparently he spent some time as a autograph forger like sort of somewhat like quasi professionally so but now he's just he's, he's old and he's destroyed by drink and he is uh basically insane to some extent and yeah. di and dying and the, the last line i have out of that chapter is how many moves wondered alex later on his way out that is if this were a sophisticated game like mahjong or chess how many moves to get from where i am to where brian duchamp is right and that, that's a big thought in Alex's mind where though he, he, his friends in the autograph business may envy him, there is an image of Brian Duchamp in Alex's mind that, that Alex is saying, if I ever reach that level, I have completely hit the bottom. And it's not even saying so much that Alex doesn't want to be in Duchamp's position. He's almost just acknowledging that right. I could be Brian Duchamp someday. Someday I could be just like him. And he never quite admits that I don't really want to be like him. He just kind of, it's almost an acknowledgement of like, shit, that's like, that's if shit happens. That's if it goes bad. Right. Yeah, and I maybe to, to grab another passage that includes Duchamp, just because I, I thought this was... A really poignant one. So this is on page 142, kind of moving through the book one here. And what's, impor what's important to say about this is, so we've already talked about how on Alex's bad acid trip, he um, got that, or somehow that autograph from Kitty Alexander appeared. So what he wants to do now is even though Duchamp is dying and is crazy, he does have an eye for autographs. Um, so Alex decides to take it to him and get it basically confirmed as the real thing. Um, and I thought this was I thought this was a somewhat tender moment that actually showed a good side of Alex and a side that cared about humans. But again, it's kind of weird because he cares about these he cares about these sort of bottom feeder people who. And arguably only because he needs something from them. So let's just read this little part here. Um, Brian, please, could we just... W.C. Fields, in that one he did. You know that one, the Dickens one? I'm like him, watching me money. Come on, you know it. What was it he said? Funny it was. Come on, and it was a... Eh. Oh, now I know it. It was expenditure 12 pounds and three shillings. Result, happiness. Income, no wait. How'd it go? No wait. Bloody hell, it's the other way around, isn't it? Income, 12. So, um, wait, hold on. I, I apologize. I didn't read the right moment here. Hold on. Ah, oh, geez. I really wanted to read this part, but let me see. Damn it. I might have to just abandon this. No, no, this is it. This is it. Okay, I just I started too early. So Alex says, so basically right now, Brian Duchamp is trying to get Alex to buy something instead of sell something. Instead of have him, because uh, Brian's dying and he just needs money probably for drink and all that. And he just... He's like, oh, I'm not, I'm not buying. I want you to buy. So Alex says, people who are about to die and the insane, these people speak into the middle distance, eyes clouded by some sort of a film, like a thick, uncryable tear, and with their hands going, distractedly picking at their chests. In Lauren Bacall's autobiography, one of Alex's all-time favorite books, she described Bogey's death that way. The odor, I realized it was decay, the hands picking at the hairs on his chest as though things were closing in and he wanted to get out. The fight to die. Duchamp was still on his feet by some miracle, but death was on him. Alex could smell it, see it, feel it, just as Lauren did. Lauren Bacall, not the goddess of all sex, as has been claimed, but the goddess of all compassion. And now, remembering Lauren's honest book, made Alex step forward and take Duchamp's busy hands and place them by his sides and say, All right, Brian, all right, what have you got for me then? So, I don't know, maybe, it, maybe it's hitting me too hard, but it's just like Alex, even though he's locked in this fantasy and he just wants this Kitty Alexander autograph to be verified, somehow face-to-face -face with this just absolutely pitiful, pitiful being, he's willing to 
think about somebody else, at least for a second. And he doesn't really have the extra money and stuff, but he's now just going to buy something from Brian. And as the next paragraph points out, he buys a ton of crap that he just, like, doesn't need. And I don't know. Might not be as important as I'm making it out to be, but I just thought it was a semi-redeeming moment for Alex here in the beginning of the book. Uh, absolutely. Sure. I definitely agree with that. And he follows up that moment by getting... He's already very drunk, and he follows it up by... Uh, Going to the autograph, the, to sell the uh, autograph. Yes. And there is the girl, Boo, who he's having an affair with, uh, or did have an affair with. Um, and he's trying to sell this autograph to the guy who works there, and, and apparently he's already sold him like four fake Kitty Alexanders in the past. Yeah. And he punched in the face and he sent to the some Chinese doctor. And goes, well, hold on. China. This, this, this is important, actually. Uh, first of all, well, also, he smokes a joint, too, before going in there, even though he's already blasted on alcohol. Yeah, so he's, like, he's like cloudy. He's, like, at the spinning stage right now. Right. Um, do, do you have the exact page where he gets punched in the face? Because I think it's beautifully written. Um. Oh, I, I'm right near it. But the, to, before we read it, one other important thing to say is that after he gets punched in the face, he should his nose is essentially or could be broken. He should be going to just a normal doctor, but part of Alex's delusional state and his misunderstanding of reality is that he doesn't go to Western doctors. He only goes to, like, voodoo Chinese doctors who, who like, don't practice Western medicine. They practice, like, weird things and give him these weird, like, herbal drinks that he's constantly making that are so gross and he because because also there's this underlying thing that he has because his dad died at age 35 or whatever of a brain tumor alex essentially views his life as this thing that is actually coming to an end like he basically is convinced that he's the same thing's going to happen to him so i just thought yeah. that was important to point out it's another level of his delusion yeah Yeah. But you are right. It is different. I mean, because of that, he he definitely uh, he puts himself in trusting these voodoo doctors and these these like doctors who work like on like just like right off the street, pretty much. Like, and uh, it's just, it's just an interesting characteristic about Alex Lee Tandem. Yeah. I mean, because part of it, I think I'm I guess I'm psychoanalyzing a little bit too much right now. I'm not a psychologist, but. Um, his dad was a Western doctor and yet died at 35 from a medical disease, you could say. So he, his faith in the enlightenment, you could say, and Western values and science is somewhat, like, crippled by this experience. Absolutely. Definitely. So, all right, so... Uh, 153 is the page where he gets punched in the face. Yes. I, do you want to read that real quick? Yeah, he says... So, one moment you were very stoned, you were having a, psych a psychotic interlude, the next, particularly if, if it is raining and you have a pretty girl screaming at you in the middle of the street, you are not. And Boot was full of questions today, questions like, what was that about? Are you completely mad? Are you trying to get me fired? What kind of person turns up in that state? Do you realize he could press charges? What goes through your mind when, you, when you're like that? Do you think that's insulting people? That insulting people helps anything? Is it broken? Do you need a doctor? <laughs> what was the one again? Asked Alex, pinching his nose to stop the blood. I mean, it just, it really shows you that. It's just, reality hits Alex all at once. He's right. constantly... When it hits him, it hits him hard, and he it it really doesn't hit him lightly. Like he he definitely once reality hits, once he's in that present moment, he's just completely lost. Definitely. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna mention one. We can talk about maybe one more scene, the most important scene I think at the end of book one, and then we can plot wise bring us into book two, and you can sort of lead us through that because I am noticing that we're already nearing an hour and we're not on the second book yet, which is awesome. Um, 
So it's important to note that you already mentioned that Alex is having a affair with this girl who is actually yelling at him right now named Boot. And Esther, at this point that we're at in the book around page 160, she actually knows about this already. So, I mean, the constitution of Esther and her sort of fortitude in dealing with Alex is impressive throughout the, throughout the book. The fact that she hasn't left him yet after everything that we've already mentioned is crazy. But either way, um, so what happens is Alex assumes that it's Adam that told her. And so he's pretty upset with Adam and he, they have a bad lunch together where Alex basically treats him like crap. But eventually... In chapter 9, Joseph and Reuben Fine come over to the, the charge is that they want to talk to Alex seriously. That's how they say it. Um, and Boot is actually there with Alex because it's pretty soon after they went to see this doctor and get his nose fixed up. And it becomes pretty clear to Alex almost immediately that Joseph is the one that told Esther about Boot. And Joseph justifies himself saying that they're all friends with Esther and it's not fair to Esther, but and like so for I guess I'll just ask, what do you think about that? What do you what do you think about Joseph's decision to say that? Like do you think he had a right to or not? Because Alex obviously gets very indignant about it and gets very uh I I think a big part of that is is the difference in their spirituality. I, I almost took it as the because Adam and um Adam, Rubifine, and uh, Joseph, they, because of their spirituality and they're more dedicated to the Judaism of religion, they, they definitely feel like there's a, a, their morals are more like right and wrong. Like there's a, a, good, a wrong and a right thing to do, or they, I don't know, I definitely get the sense of um, Joseph did it almost for his well-being in a way, like almost that because of what you were doing, and you're being unfaithful to someone who we consider our friend, even though you are our friend, I had to do the right thing. Um, and I mean, I think Joseph, we haven't really talked about him enough. His relationship with Alex is probably, it's, it's definitely a complicated one in, yeah. in throughout the story. But I mean, Adam is like Alex's best friend. That's his relationship. They understand each other deeply and on a deep level. Rubifine is kind of 50-50. There are times Alex can stand them and he considers them a great friend. There are other times where Alex is like, well, I don't even really like this guy. Yeah. Um, but Joseph is the... the he, is, he used to be an autograph man. He's no longer an autograph man. He was the one who got Alex into the hobby of getting autographs. Joseph now works at an insurance company. He is living a working life and it's more stable. And Alex strongly feels that Joseph um, is either angry with him, jealous with him, or jealous for him, or he, there's clear tension. There's clear tension that their relationship has changed since Joseph has no longer been an autograph man. That's, a, that's an important point. That's what I was going to mention if you didn't. So what I think, I think it's important to read this last bit from page uh, 166 over to 167. Um, so basically after Alex realizes that Joseph is the one that told Esther, he says to him, yeah, we're going to drink vodka until we're wicked drunk, and then I'm going to beat the snot out of you, essentially. And they're the type of friends where Joseph essentially says okay, and essentially just sits down, and they start pounding shots. Um, and Boot says, how are you guys? And Joseph says, never been better. Uh, Boot bit her thumbnail. This isn't much of a party, is it? I keep feeling I want to cry. It's rather like a, what'd you call it, a wake or something. It's as if someone died, but no one really knows who. I always think there's only so much Leonard Cohen a party can take. Actually, she said, swigging her wine and taking a stumbling step forward. I think I might go, actually, Alex, if that's okay. I might just toddle home. Don't go, Boot, says Joseph flatly, still looking at the low coffee table in front of him. It'll just be boys left if you leave. No good if it's just boys. Let's watch a movie or something. Be fun. Thanks, Joe, but I think I better... Alex licked the joint he was rolling and looked around him. Where'd the rabbi piss off to, then? Boot shrugged. Don't know. Upstairs, I think. Missing, said Joseph. Presumed dead. 
You leave, said Alex, in the draw of the popular actor John Wayne, and the rabbi gets it. And <laughs> I just this is this is like one of Zadie's just beautiful uh, scenes, and it's important because it's going to lead us into what Ruben finds doing upstairs, which is important to bring us into book two. But the other important thing I think is that even amidst this extremely tense situation that, that you've mentioned a few times, Joseph's still joking, but there's also still that wall of a TV generation in front of it. Like, how does Alex respond in this extremely tense and important moment? He jokes with a movie reference. He says, if you leave, the rabbi gets it. And it's kind of just, it's just, it, there's like something about it that's funny, but there's something about it that's also very, uh, sort of deranged on some sense and uh, in some way and it's not healthy or not helpful um so it's important to mention that reuben fine is upstairs on the mission that him and joseph came up with of destroying alex's kitty alexander autograph that he thinks real and they think this is going to help pop him out of the delusional state that he's in um so of course that's an interesting ethical decision that we can talk about if you want uh, whether that's they have the right to do that or not, but what they don't know is that Duchamp has given Alex Duchamp, sorry, has given Alex a Kitty Alexander that he forged and asked Alex to sell it for him, and Alex is going to get ten percent of that cut, and that's actually the picture that Ruben Fine finds upstairs and rips. So that's just important to keep in our mind as we move forward. I don't know if you have anything to say about that night, um, but that's basically. Other than getting on the plane and heading over to New York, that's kind of the end of book one. And we leave book one here where Alex's friends are sort of trying to make his decisions for him. And Alex is going to New York, even though Esther's having her operation on Sunday. And he's using the excuse of that he can't get out of it because it's been planned for a long time. But really, Kitty Alexander lives in New York and he has some hope of getting the autograph verified firsthand. Well, I think, yeah, so one thing from the night with uh, Joseph and the argument, I mean, there's like this huge argument with Alex saying, Joseph, I don't believe you. You've always been competitive with me. You can't stand to see me. Wait a bloody minute. Wait. Alex dropped Grace to the floor. God, I'm an idiot. You told Cotterell to expect me with that Alexander, right? Am I right? You told him that I was wandering around town with a forgery? You bastard. Well, for your information, I was selling one for Brian Duchamp, who actually needs m the money. So, well done there, Joseph. What's wrong with you? You're trying to mess me up. So, this, this really explains a lot of Joseph and, and uh, Alex's relationship. I mean, I don't know if it's confirmed whether or not Joseph informed no, that's definitely not confirmed. He definitely told us there about Bood, but I don't know about that part. It seems but possible, but... It is possible, and it, so it, it, it didn't happen, right? It, it's going both ways. It seems Alex is definitely unhappy with... He's, def, he's definitely in, like, a unhappy position in life. He's not the happiest guy. Like, he's definitely pretty depressed. He's a strong alcoholic, and... um there's a point where I think Alex is blaming everyone around him for his problems. Like, he's blaming Adam for being too religious in ways and being too pushy towards Judaism, or he's blaming Joseph for trying to sabotage him. At the same time, if Joseph is going behind his back, which I could see him doing, there is a jealousy there. Maybe Joseph is also thinking that since I'm no longer in the business, since Alex is in the business, I'm jealous he's doing that, and I would rather see him fail than succeed. Because if he fails, as long as he fails, then I can justify leaving the business. Yes. There's definitely there in this weird relationship where they're clearly just unstable together in one room. And it seems like Joseph is trying to hide the instability of, of their friendship situation um, while Alex is kind of trying to confront it. He's trying to really bring it up constantly. And re really, like, he he's trying to read between the lines here. Um, one thing that we have to talk about before book one's over, though, is Alex is talking to Marvin, the milkman, oh, the milk yeah. guy, and he discovers that... Kitty Alexander is not a forgery. 
Yes, yes. He discovers that there is, that what happened was Alex got a package the day that he went to Adam's two trip. And he didn't open it because he was already on his way over it. And he didn't open it until he was already tripping. Yeah. And what happened was Joseph saw Alex walk into the kitchen and come back with the autograph. So in Joseph's mind, Alex had clearly forged it while he was in the kitchen. Right. But on the other hand, Alex was not sure exactly what happened. He had trouble putting the events together of that night. And he realized that Kitty had sent him an autograph that day. And he opened the package there, and it all happened at once. And it was almost so unbelievable that there was no way his friends could believe that it was true. So Alex is going over to New York to meet with Kitty, um, but it's not necessarily to prove that the forgery is real. But more, he, he in his mind, he's thanking her. Right, right. He wants to thank her, but in reality, he now has an address sent by Kitty Alexander with an idea of exactly where she lives or not exactly but at least the neighborhood yeah. so she definitely he's trying to meet his idol here like he, he's saying he's gonna say thank you but he, honestly he's probably just a whole ball of emotions when he thinks about this moment right that's that's an absolutely vital point to point out and what do you think this might be a question that we're where we're talking about throughout the rest of the book but i just want to pose it initially here what does this, the fact that this autograph is real, say for what we've been saying about Alex living in sort of a delusional state? Because to me, maybe the reason that I like neglected to mention, even though I think it's obviously such a vital point in terms of the plot, for the way that I'm thinking about Alex being disconnected from his life, it actually doesn't matter. Like it, it like it, it doesn't, it doesn't make his obsession and infatuation with fame and with his idol sort of any more real, you know, like, do, do, I mean, I don't know. I'm trying to think of another way to put it. I don't know exactly. I do know what I mean. I just don't know exactly how to say it. Like it's, it's just another autograph. Like, even though it's real, what's what, I guess I'm wondering, like, there's this idea throughout the book of what's actually r real. And that sounds trite, but what I mean is what's different between a forgery and a, and a real one. And I would argue when it comes to something like an autograph, nothing. And yet this is the most important thing in Alex's life as the rest of his life just crumples around him. So maybe we'll, we'll be talking about that more. But before you bring us into book two, I just want to direct our attention to um, just one of the stylistic ways that Zadie Smith set up these chapters. I was wondering if you had a had a thought about this because I don't know exactly what to think. I have one intuition that's not very fledged out, but in book one, you have chapter name, chapter titles, chapter numbers with names. And then these little things below them that it's almost like the way I would imagine like a screenplay looks the way that it tells you, it's sort of like what you're about to read. So like chapter 10 says crown Jimmy's antiques, highballs with Lola, Lola conspiracy theories. And it's kind of like what you're about to read in sort of like scene format. And then, yeah. and then you get to book two and you can, you're going to pick up with chapter one, obviously, but the Zen of Alex Lee tandem. And now he's on his way to New York with this autograph that he now knows is real. And he's going to possibly try and find Kitty Alexander and there's no none of that anymore. It's not like a screenplay. Instead, it says chapter one, the search for the bull. And then there's pictures. And the pictures is sort of cartoonish, wouldn't you say? And I don't know. It, 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 it kind of the pictures kind of remind me of like a fairy tale now. And this is actually a thought that just came to me as I was preparing to move over to book two. But I, I'm wondering if there's something in it because like. Now, Alex is jumping, like, straight into the delusion. Real or not, or whatever. He is leaving his other world behind in London, and he is going to New York with his autograph, and it's him and Kitty Alexander now. Like, it's, that's it. That's, that's his life. He's trying to get to her. You know? And it's yeah. kind of like fairy, it's like fantastical and like a fairy tale, kind of. And, I mean, uh, one thing as well is uh, a continuous, um, word throughout the name of these uh, book, the chapters in book 
too is that it's this mention of the bull. Yes. So, like chapter one is the search for the bull. Chapter two is like uh, trace uh, discovering the footprints. Chapter three is perceiving the bull. Chapter four is catching the bull. It's like that was one thing I was really trying to keep an eye out for through chapter two is what exactly is the bull? Like what? What is the bull? What is he searching for? Is it Kitty? Is uh, for a second I thought like is Kitty the bull? But I think um, I don't know. I think it's a question that that's we definitely a question. I have a pr- I have a uh, opinion about it. I think I think it's kind of like either it's like the bullseye maybe or just just like that quote that was in the beginning it's the center of things it's meaning it's contentment it's satisfaction it's being able to stop the chase for kitty alexander it's getting to some moment where alex can actually like feel secure in himself and happy with where he is possibly i don't know that's interesting that's that's definitely a question to think about as we move through Mm-hmm. I don't know, it's some Jewish term, it's on page 80, there's a diagram. Yeah. Um, and the name of it, each of those 10 things is the name of one of the chapters in the book. So you have like crown, wisdom, love, eternity, presence, foundation, splendor, um, and all these things when you talk about like at the beginning of each chapter in book one, she themes it love. This one's a love chapter, or this one is the power chapter, and all of those things are um, one of the components to whatever that Jewish diagram is that Adam has in his room. Oh, so that's really interesting. I didn't even uh, notice that. That's really cool. I don't. I tried looking at the diagram, trying to understand it, but I mean, honestly, like. Oh yeah, it's so esoteric. There's definitely certain cultural references. This book that if you just don't know it, you're not going to entirely understand it. Yes. Um, and I think I mean there's a lot of research that can be done to fully understand what Zadie Smith is doing, but I'll say from someone who is um, very outside a lot of the cultures that they're talking about here, I thought it was I was completely engulfed in the characters and how they just kind of meshed with each other. I thought she she built her characters up very well. Absolutely. Um, so starting with book two, um, I'll try to move past, past this with the time. We got, we got, we got like 45 minutes. Yeah, we got time. It's like 7.16 right now for me, so it's, you got like, what, 45 minutes? Yeah, just about. Alright, so I, I think we could, I think we could finish this out. Um, but, uh, so, so, okay, going through each chapter. Chapter one, we have the arrival in New York City. Um, oh, it's actually, is it the plane ride over? Uh, yes, it's the plane ride over. And I think it includes the arrival as well. Yeah, um... Not much important there, I wouldn't say. There's two colleagues, Lovelier and Dove. Yeah. Um, there. He's getting ready for some meeting he's having with a girl named Honey Richardson tomorrow. And Honey, um, just, uh, one thing that was important, I noticed, uh, a good line here... 193. Um, the only way he could travel this kind of distance was to make wherever he went as much like Mount Joy as possible. That really says a lot about Alex. I mean, he he travels and he clearly has this attachment to his home, Mount Joy. I mean, to the point where when he goes into a hotel room, he doesn't want to look like a hotel room. He needed to look somewhat like his own um, house. I mean, it says he also placed his extended arm upon his desk and swept whatever was there into a carrier bag, which he emptied now onto his hotel bed with the intention of spreading the items around the place. This was traveling without moving. I mean, he really just, there is definitely this very, very uh, huge sense of, atta- like, just attachment issues. Um, I mean, Alex is not very attached to anything. He actually doesn't see the point in really being attached or like completely set on one certain thing so like this is like on top of autographs and Kitty Alexander in particular 
it seems like Mount Joy is definitely an image that he hangs on to a lot. Um, definitely. I have, I have one interesting thing to say about that. Um, we can kind of, we can ask ourselves if he's always like that when he's traveling or is his subconscious right now making him grasp onto Mount Joy, kind of reminding him that that's where he should be right now. He should, you should not be out here chasing this dream. You should be by your girlfriend of 10 years bedside as she gets her pacemaker changed. Like that's a pretty serious operation. I mean, she kind of shrugs it off like it's nothing, and I guess with today's medicine, it's not super serious, but they're cutting her open and, like, putting something in there, and he's off chasing a dream. So maybe maybe this, like, necessity to dress up his current surroundings as Mount Joy is his subconscious reaching out a little bit. And then uh, you mentioned that Dove and Lovely are with him, which is obviously important because that's part of his delusion, traveling with him, so... This is and, great. Um, yeah, she's definitely an interesting character. I mean, like some lines that I really liked. Um, if he lived to be a hundred, he never expected to meet another woman wearing skin tight black rubber gloves in a public restaurant. Um, yes. Certain lines that she really just thinks of distinctive qualities to make these people uh, stick out. Another one, she spoke therefore to his back. She had a husky voice, but in Oroton, serious one. There was no element of flirtation in it, nor anything overtly mad. Um, and of course, we're going to um, find out why that is. Yeah, you, you definitely get, like, she's taking it seriously, and she's she's not in the mood to, um, she, she definitely is trying to, like, almost hide something, in a way. And we definitely, I mean, like, so we can talk about her character. We find out she was a porn star. Is that the, is that the case? That's essentially yeah. what she was, yeah. There's like a video of her, like pretty much just like going down on some guy, and she now is like famous to the point where she even like people stop her in the street and ask for her autograph. She's known as very easy, I guess the term would be. Yeah. Um, in the autograph community, lovely or considers her to be um, just someone who's very easy to get in bed with. Um, so I mean, she's definitely hiding from a. Her and Alex are very similar. They're in a very similar boat. It seems very like they're, auto they're autograph people, but no one takes them seriously in real life. Um, and I think that that is a huge part of why they go on this delusional adventure together is because they, I think they, they finally found someone who is making the delusion a little worthwhile. And yeah. I think that's, she kind of becomes Alex's partner in crime. Very much so. Yeah. Um, is there anything else you want to add to Honey Richardson and the chapter where we meet her? No, I, I think um, you. I think you got it all. I mean, as you said, she's very much hiding from her wife. Like when, when they're with, when she's with Alex and they're looking at things, seeing if they're going to trade or make a deal or whatever. She makes Alex put on gloves, and at one point he touches one of the items without gloves, and then she runs off to the bathroom to like wash her hands. So this is definitely some severe psychological distress on her part. And as you said, her and Alex are kind of two peas in a pod to some sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so moving forward in the chapter, I mean, we, we see other people in the autograph community. Um, it's all very sad um, environment. <laughs> I would read some excerpts, but this isn't really like anything huge to take in. It's kind of things we've talked about. Like it's, Everyone here is very sad. They drink a lot. They they share old stories. They're they're just constantly talking about. Um, Alex kind of notes that a lot of them are opening up about misery in their life and how miserable their lives are, and that this is like for them, it's almost like they've hung on to this hobby because it's the only like sense of community that they that they have in a way. Um, for, I mean, like, it is a great passage. I mean, he traded with them all, listened to them. They needed to talk. Maybe the business itself was, maybe the business itself was simply an excuse for this need. Alex learned 
could never truly love a flat-chested woman, no matter how kind she might be to him. A stranger called Ernie Popper told him that most days he wished he were dead. <laughs> I mean, this this just shows you that. I think what it said to me was these people are so engulfed in this autograph community, this hobby, that they actually lack people in their lives to go to to spill these darkness that these dark realities to to kind of vent to and i think alex i mean alex is fortunate to have the friends he has and i think that's a note that's definitely being taken here in alex's mind even though he doesn't entirely say it i think he def i can't help but feel that he's looking at these people and he doesn't see the point of why they are complaining or sharing their dark realities of their world. Um, and he doesn't really see why. And a huge part of that is Alex has a friend group that he can vent to. Right. He has a friend group that he, he has something that they don't. They, they are completely engulfed in this life. And Alex is kind of on the edge of, if I lose my friends, I become one of them pretty much. Very much. I think, I think another, uh, a, another beautiful image that caps that off um, that sort of demonstrates this sad bunch is at the autograph um, convention or whatever you would call it that they're at. Obviously, because it's autographs and it's kind of their business, there's going to be some famous guest stars there. But the state of the autograph convention is so desperate that last year they, their guest was one of the guys who dropped the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Or one of that. I forget if it was Nagasaki or Hiroshima. And then this year, the guests were to be announced when they when they got. But when they got there, it was one of the guys who dropped the bomb on Hiroshima. So like this, it's kind of showing that this is a stagnant uh, sort of searching group of people who just don't have like are. I would say deluded by this idea of fame and this this like industry that actually means nothing in in like our age like the autographs don't hold the weight that they once had because you can kind of see your idol on tv every day if you want like it's not the way it once was so yeah. sure and there's a little um excerpt here in the next chapter where honey kind of talks about her fame i really like this piece. What, what page is this they're walking through the street this is on 218 okay they're walking and Alex is noticing that people um, are making gestures towards Honey and they're noticing her. They recognize that this girl has had a sex tape out and they, they recognize who she is. And Alex asks her, you which know, Which says it, which, which, which has an, which it makes an interesting comment on everyone else. Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> because they're all living in the world of TV and the, the access to pornography and all of that. Yeah. I mean, like, when they live in a digital world and the fact that that many people are well aware of who she is just shows how much people are using their phone using going on the internet it shows all of that and um, and looking at the things that they're now demonizing her for yes exactly <laughs> they, they demonize the people who are entertaining doing it but at the same time they're participating in it probably more than she even was right for her <laughs> Definitely. Um, she says that she's talking about what people look at her in the street. She says, Every time I feel sick, said Honey a minute later as they jogged across. But the weird thing is, if nobody looks, I notice. I just notice and I feel, I don't know even, I don't even know how to explain it. Like out of focus. So this idea of her fame has almost become part of her identity so much to the point where if people are not noticing her in her in the street, she kind of doesn't feel like she is herself. It really touches well on social image, um, just who you are in society. And it, it really just hits a, a huge point, especially walking through New York City where you're surrounded by people. I mean, talk about, you know, who do you want to be in this world? And you go to a city in front of people and you can really just try to distinguish yourself from others. And she, she clearly has. She has distinguished herself, but she's almost become attached to this identity that um, has been put over her, her face. 
that, that's uh, that's such an important point and it echoes we i didn't really touch on this in book one but alex is constantly saying throughout the book that he's a famous person that no one knows about yet and even though he, because he's going to write the book that's going to hit it big and like it's just, he is this great genius that's squandered by the society in which he lives so he can't produce the, the output of fabulous work that he would be able to if he didn't have to waste time going to autograph conventions and all that. And um, so her, um, Honey, like him, is just, like you say, attached to this idea of fame. And even though it brings her some degree of misery and some degree of consternation in her life, she also... It's, part, it's also just a huge part of her identity. Definitely. Um, do you have anything you want to say about Max Crosser? I didn't highlight really anything from their original meeting. Pretty much what happens is they are able to find Max Crosser at his address. Uh, Max Crosser is pretty much a, a kitty's agent in a way. Yes. He, he pretty much handles everything that comes and goes through Kitty, um, whether it be mail or even walking her dog, like he's taking care of almost everything for her. Right. Um, and in the first encounter, I mean, he's a pretty cold guy. He doesn't want anything to do with them. He thinks that they're out to sabotage Kitty. And we don't really, we don't really, uh, I mean, I didn't, I, I kind of took it as like, that's just exactly who he is. He's, I kind of understood his intentions, but he's also kind of pretty obsessed with Kitty as well. Absolutely. Very, Absolutely. Very and even though I think you can understand his intentions, I don't think he his actions completely care, carry out as the way of a of a caring person. No, I would like agree. He, he's, he's pretty obsessive. Definitely. And the, the one thing I guess I would add about him is that from the beginning, he's set up as an adversary of Alex's because for years, I mean, Alex has been writing these fan letters to Kitty for a decade, probably. Um, and he's gotten countless form letter responses from Max. He knows that it's from Max saying, thank you for your interest and all that. But Kitty is unavailable and all that. So he's just an adversary of Alex's from the beginning. Which is um, which is creepy. Which sorry, which which, which, is, which is which is a little bit like not uh, not awesome on their part. <laughs> oh yeah, well this shows their obsession. Yeah, that they are so obsessed. Like they they're not ready to just. It, it's also I think it's also they want to prove everyone wrong. They want they want to accomplish what everyone's telling them is unaccomplishable. Yeah. Thank you. 
Right. And he continues to be extremely, extremely, uh, um, he doesn't know what to say to her. I mean, he's very confused. Right. It's funny, it's funny that the only sort of defense he could come up with is, but I'm Alex Lee Tandem. Almost, but he's like, almost, that's like a chance in the dark where if she were to have read his letters and if that autograph is a true autograph, she should know the name Alex Lee Tandem. Right. Like, she should be well aware of how much he has written her and is fascinated about her and obsessed over her. So, I mean, like, yeah, she definitely, he's kind of putting his name out there hoping that that is enough to get his foot in this door. Right. Um, I kind of want to, like, move quickly. Um, but pretty much, do you want to explain? All right, so let's, let's talk about what do we get out of this conversation with Kitty? I mean, a lot. We get a lot. I mean, for starters, Kitty is really not about everything the autograph man stands for, the movies, celebrity fame, um, the fan base, and everything like that. Kitty is not about that. She no. doesn't care at all about that. To, she's some, very, to some extent, she's actually like a pure artist. She's, she's very centered. Yeah. She, she's very well aware of her emotions and who she is. She's experimented a lot, you can tell. Like, she's just very experienced. She's lived a life of adventure, and she's very centered. She's very one with herself. And Alex is the exact opposite. Right. And then I guess the, the one other thing we can mention here plot-wise, and I guess it's important uh, thematically as well, is we find out from this conversation that she has no money. That she's actually... No the what? Right, she has no money, so this is this is what leads to Alex coming up with his crazy plan that takes us through to the rest of the the novel that I'm sure you're going to talk about. Yeah, and how does she lose her money? She actually says that. Um, that doesn't stick out to me in terms of memory, but um, it says I have no money. She said simply, "This apartment is rent controlled." Um. Uh, it's a little further, because that's after Alex already proposes his plan. Um, I don't know exactly how she loses her... I mean, I guess just living in a... I mean, she's not making movies anymore. You're, you're, you're a retired actress, so your money's not coming in anymore. You basically just had whatever massive amount of money you had, and she probably just lived hard. And now has no money. Yeah, she... I thought she said at some point, like, she was giving Max money to find people. Oh, maybe I missed that. She was giving him... Um... Yeah, that, that's really, that, that doesn't even matter. That's like a minuscule note. Either, um, either way, either way, it sets up the fact that she is going to be motivated by Alex's plan to make some money. <laughs> yeah. It's at the bottom of page 236 if you want to read it. So, so Alex, 
Alex didn't want to hear the philosophy and thumped his fist on the coffee table, toppling the cups. Let me understand this, he said, pushing Honey's hand off his shoulder. So, what? He just had a grudge, meaning Max, against me? You got other letters sometimes, didn't you? He just screened mine, or what? He just did it for a laugh, just wanted to waste 13 years of... No, said Kitty, holding the letters to her chest. He protects me, also. He is very paranoid, Max. He worries that some people get a little crazy, very attached, like a Norman Bates or something. People are strange about movies. He thinks that it's his job to protect me from the crazy people. This is an irony. If you knew Max, he himself is a little crazy. I married him once, so I know, for seven days in Hawaii, but it was enough. And he proved to be homosexual, which in this business is rather common. Oh yes, she said to Honey's open mouth. My dear, everybody should marry a homosexual at least once. It robs a pretty girl of all her sexual vanity. It is very healthy. Yeah, so that, yeah, that, that, that says so much about Kitty. Yeah, who speaks? She's like just one. She's yeah, that, that just says so much right there. She is just very unique. Mm-hmm. watches porn at one time in the book one. women are not just symbols like because of his infatuation with kitty he like he has this very detached attitude from women and like you say he just looks at them for sex and attractiveness and he he views them just as symbols in a sense Because like you said, we still have like, we still have about a hundred pages left. What would you say is the next most important part in the book? Because we can kind of just bring it forward plot-wise a little bit. I would say almost back to London. She's going to stay at his house or his apartment, yeah. which is like the fan's dream. Oh, dude, actually, this is a great line. This is right before they go back to London. 
Okay, what page? While they're still in New York City, the last page of chapter five. Okay. Um, two fifty-eight. It says this is like from Kitty's perspective. Uh, she rolls away from him and grips the cover leg. She, her fingers have gone cold. Even when making those films, even as a know-nothing girl, she had slept badly on the suspicion of just how many of these people, these moviegoers, take a line, take a look, and use it on a loved one. So yeah. even as she is getting to know Alex, is really thinking a lot of his girlfriend, Esther, who she's never met before, and just... You can tell she's really nervous that, like, everything that she has done, like, how unfortunate it is for someone to look at her movies and hold her fictional character as a standard. Right. And to, and to put your, the, the people in your real life, the people you love, to hold them against that standard as those fictional characters, which just speaks so much about the world we live in today. Oh, that, that's that's one of Zadie Smith's most nuanced comments throughout this book that we've sort of danced around the entire time. It's so, so true and so deep. I think it's it's this this idea that I I, I would just rephrase it the way that you said it. So we'll just we'll leave it at that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think. Uh, so we all just get to London. Uh, yeah. Let's see. Chapter seven, I believe. Maybe a little before that. Maybe during chapter six. Yeah, I gotta say this. This was. I just had to. I knew. I knew this line was gonna come up. Um, Where's this? This is. This is when he's talking to Kitty about coming to London, and the idea pops in his head that she could come over with him and like do the autographs and all of it's coming together. And uh, Zadie Smith writes, "They heard the window across the way close again, and there was something conclusive in it." The end of something over there, the beginning of something over here. And I read that line, and I was just like, that's, like, take away from the, like, forget about the story, forget about the characters, forget about all of it. That is just a really good metaphor. Two sentences, just like, there's so much, you can feel it emotionally, physically, yeah. it's just entirely there. I just thought that was genius. That's just a shout out to Zadie Smith, dude. She, the, she really. There are so there are so many lines like that. So, what do you think? Um, I don't want to like impose on you because I know you're the one bringing us through book two. But how important do you think the rest of the plot is? Well, all right. I mean, okay. So they go to. I mean, he, they're setting up for Alex's dad's what the Kavanaugh or whatever. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, so, so why don't you, why don't you just give us a brief plot summary that brings us to there? Because you're you're jumping pretty much to the end, which I think is the important part, and it will allow us to comment on why people should read this book and why this is an important book. Um, but do you want to just bring us plot wise to what, like maybe some intervening details? Pretty much. actually talking with a pastor um, who will be used, who will be the pastor at um, Alex's, it's like the Kabanash or something. This is pretty much a Jewish ritual um, where people worship uh, who is passed. And they kind of, it's a gift in a way, given to people who are passed on and kind of like a gift of remembrance, from memory in a way. Um, and they're planning this out. And... He goes home and it turns out Esther kind of went into his house and so she's talking with Kitty and they're getting along great. Esther and Kitty are great friends. He has this amazing day with um, Esther. It's like, it's just very, they're very intimate. They're very close yet again. It's the first time they actually have seen each other in person in the entire book. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have... Um, Story moves forward the next day. Esther, they're sleeping on the couch. And Esther finds Boots' leggings, <laughs> and in the couch, so immediately it starts off. It's like the happiest chapter. I mean, happiest passage of Alex in the entire book. It's just pure happiness. That's all I really have to. I even wrote too good to be 
true, here comes the shit is what I wrote on the side of it. Like the way that the, sh- the, par- the paragraph goes, you just know it's like, oh, like there's definitely going to be some conflict coming up. And that's exactly when she finds the tights. Right. And so Esther's this. Um, and Max uh, apparently alerted the authorities and everyone thinks Kitty Alexander's dead and it's all over the news. And so all this criticism about her career and who she was as an actor yeah. is coming out and like, really, she's all over the news right now. And it's the day before the auction, which Alex is selling all of her merchandise, which is probably the next important place to take it, is the auction. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Alex has this plan that he's not going to tell Kitty about what's going on because as long as she stays silent, then the her pieces are going to be worth more. But in this moment, he gets a memory of fame. Alex gets this memory. What do you mean? he gets this moment of fame? In the autograph community, it's like Alex has now been sent to the the top. He's, cre- he's pretty much pulled out one of the greatest autograph man <laughs> scheme in history. He's pretty much the greatest, yeah. Do you want to just do you want to just summarize the end of the book for us, and then we can just talk about why this is important? I think. so funny that was such a brilliant scene it was but it was also like I was sitting there like Dude, this, is, is, this is an ungodly amount of food <laughs> point where I was like and the, the ABC's began after five glasses of whiskey I know Wait, just just say, say one, go over one more time exactly what he's doing, because I don't know if it's exactly clear. What's he doing? He's, he's drinking. Okay, so he goes to a bar that is very ratchet. <laughs> 
This is after he got a ton of money for selling the autographs. Yeah, but really, he has no money. The money he won is one to Kitty, and he told Duchamp that his autograph, right. which Alex never sold, went for 15000 which is all the money Alex got from being the manager of Kitty. Right. Those. So all of his winnings is going to Duchamp, which is it's just... So he's, he's pulled off the greatest autograph thing in history, but he is no, in no different shape than he was before. Could, th could this be him finding the important things? Like, for him, like, the money isn't what's important right now. It's just doing the greatness to some extent. And so that's, that is, like, the question here is, is he just looking for fame? Right. Does he just want to be famous? Is because he, he's not, financially, he's in the same boat as he was in. But it's his social image. It is his identity in society that has changed. He is now no longer a failure. He's actually a, a person of great success. Right. Um, what, what, are, what do you think? Is there any... Pretty much, I mean, like, we have to go through... Like... Yeah, I, I, I would I would just say it's important to know I, I'd say I'd say we covered all the plot pretty extensively. I mean that we, 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 But I would also say that if, if anyone wanted to read the book and everyone should read the book, there's so much more than we could ever have gone through in this. But it's just important to note that at the end Alex does go through with that with that Jewish service that Adam's been trying to get him to go through for years. And we, we, we talked about his friends a ton, and their relationship was so deep. I mean, we have to remember that Joseph, Adam, and Rubenfine were all there the day that Alex Lee's dad died. Uh, on, on, the, on the way to the, to the wrestling match, Alex's dad wrote out what they call notes in Britain, but what it is is basically a statement saying that if this guy wins, I'll give you this much money. And Alex's dad did that for all of them, basically saying if the bad wrestler wins, I'll give you a few bucks. And so they have this thing between them where like you swear on your note and it's the most important, most uh, supernaturally, that's not the right word, but the most significantly ordained like piece of um, promise that they could make to each other is swearing on the note. And Alex eventually swears on the note that he's going to do this service, and at the end he doesn't. And it's it's he's he's he, at this point he's chased the fame. He's he's caught the bull to some extent, and it's just still not what makes him happy. What, what, what's making him happy is at the end with Adam Jacobs, Rabbi Mark Rufin, Joseph Klein, his girlfriend Esther Jacobs, like coming back into reality to some extent with his friends here through this Jewish ceremony of togetherness and friendship and he just he, he grows a lot throughout this book and I and even though he's so pitiful at certain points and even near the end drinking himself through the ABCs but it's that constant fight for for meaning in our TV generation and I think th like aside from the awesome language and the scenes and the characters and the the moments that just hit you so hard this book is a good meditation on what it means to live in the 21st century and how it is that you can navigate relationships and meaning in in our tv generation so i, I really enjoyed it and i think that people should read it and, and just bouncing off something you said um the idea that, that alex always if alex's father Yeah. And what that signifies there, I mean, you have the good father is who everyone expects to win. It's kind of the way it goes, the way everything moves. And then you have the bad fighter who never wins, but maybe, who knows, like his dad is putting his money on the bad fighter. Later on in the book, we have the conversation with Joseph and Alex where they, they um, pretty much Joseph actually explains that he is envious, not so much jealous or looks down on Alex, but he's actually envious of who Alex is because being an autograph man is very similar to being in a, it's a similar round to like an artist or a gambler at least where you're playing the odds against you. Like you are, you're not living, Adam is, I mean, uh, Joseph is working a stable job at an insurance company. He, was, he has given up autograph 
polygraph business to do what society deems acceptable. Right. And in many ways, Joseph has become the good fighter, you know, the one everyone imagines is going to win. But maybe Alex being this autograph man in a way is, is some way of keeping to his father's bet of bet on the bad fighter. You know, like put your money in with where the difficult life is and put your money in where um where it's not easy and where and like having to face adversity and, and competition. Um I mean there's also I think a huge line, I think this paragraph is like the paragraph of the book. It could be most important one. Okay, where's this one? Three forty. Um this Adam and Alex had this conversation right before his father's ceremony. Um and Alex is just talking about how he thinks his relationship with Esther is coming to an end, and he's just in this complete boat of, he's facing a lot of struggle again, a lot of emotional turmoil, a lot of confusion, even after all the success he just had. Right. And he's, he's kind of sitting here with Adam and just taking it all in, and if he ever has any spiritual epiphany, this is probably what it is. He says, Adam knelt down where he was, and for a second, Alex feared he was going to ask him to meditate. Wait, hang on, this is the one. Oh, no, yeah, that is. Yeah, that's he it. Ask, he was going to ask him to meditate or pray, and he now knew with more certainty than ever before that those two acts were beyond him. No more than that, he didn't want them. He wanted to be in the world and take what came with it. Endings, local and universal. Full stops, periods, looks of injury, disappointment, and the everyday war. He liked the everyday war. He was taking that with fries to go. Yeah. And it really just says that Alex has completely realized his purpose in a way, or what gives him purpose. And that is the everyday war, the, the struggle, um, and how he doesn't want to take the easy road. He, he chooses the high road, and he's willing to accept that, and he's willing to take life as it comes and just kind of let life happen a bit without trying to control it with any, I don't know, with he, any faith. He's, re he's ready to push the rock. It's exactly, dude. Literally, like, I read that, and I was like, that one paragraph's like pushing the rock right here. Like, literally, it's of course, man, it always, it's always going to come back to Sister Fitz Street all the time. It always I'm is. Saying, yeah. All right. Uh, well, that was yeah. great. Yeah, th thanks for uh, thanks for reading the book with me. Thanks for talking about it. We haven't decided on our um, our book for month three, but we'll be back again next month for another episode of Critical Absorptions uh, with another book ready to talk about it with all you guys. Thank you for listening.